Good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you again to our online service. We thank you for joining us this Sunday. I really hope you're enjoying August long weekend and uh, either enjoying or surviving this hot weather that we're having. Um, I want to also announce before we get started here, uh, just a quick reminder that next Sunday, August the 9th, we have our next church picnic and we really would love to have all of you there. Uh, it's been so long since we've been able to be together on a Sunday morning to worship with one another and so uh, it'll be great to have you there. Uh, it's next Sunday morning, August the 9th at 12 o'clock. As soon as our service ends, you can kind of gather your things and then we'll go and meet together, uh, eat lunch together. It's bring your own food and beverage so and also bring a chair. Uh, we'll just sit out, we'll play some games out in the grass uh, and enjoy ourselves. If you'd like directions to where we're going to meet, go ahead and email the church and we'll send you that information. I'm going to try something a little bit different this morning in order to prepare our hearts and our minds for worship. I have some trivia questions and I'm going to need the kids to be involved in this. So kids, if you can pay attention, uh, we're going to test your trivia and see if you know the answers to some of these questions. But hopefully this uh, gets our hearts uh, and our minds focused on the God we're about to worship and praise together. And so the first question I'm going to ask this morning is this. How many times does the Bible mention the word snow? How many times is the word snow in the Bible? Is it 24 times, 5 times, never, or 12 times? Got your answer yet? Go ahead, tell your parents, tell one another. The answer is 24 times. There are actually 24 times in which the Bible mentions snow. All right, the second question is this. Are you ready? Finish this verse. In addition to all this, take up your shield of blank with which you can ex extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take up your shield of blank. Is it the shield of faith, shield of spirit, shield of protection, or shield of righteousness? Which of these will help us to extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one? Got your answer? The answer is the shield of faith. This is in Ephesians 6, verse 16. All right, next question is a very good one, uh, very important. Uh, what will the outcome be of honoring your father and your mother? What will the outcome be of honoring your father and your mother? Is it that you will live long in the land? That you will prosper in all you do? That you will be blessed to the seventh generation? Or that you will have bountiful crops? You guys have your answer yet? And the answer is you will live long in the land. This is Exodus chapter 20, verse 12. All right, next question is, when Jesus died, what three things happened? When Jesus died, what three things happened? Pick from this list of five. Earthquake, a plague on the house of Pilate, a veil in the temple was torn, all the babies cried at once, or the tombs broke open. Which of the three things happened? And the answer is an earthquake, uh, the veil in the temple was torn, and tombs broke open. This is Matthew 27, verses 51 to 52. And the final question this morning is this. In Revelation, Jesus says, do not be afraid. I am the blank and the blank. Is it the first and the last, the way and the truth, the life and the truth? or the lion and the lamb? This is sort of a trick question since Jesus is actually all of the above. Uh, but in Revelation chapter 1, verse 17, Jesus says, Do not be afraid, for I am the first and the last. And so let's go ahead now. We're going to praise God together. I invite you to sing along with me in your home. Uh, I'll lead us in prayer, and then let's go ahead and sing praise to our God. God, we are so grateful this morning uh, that you gift us life, uh, that you gift us this opportunity through Jesus Christ to be in your holy presence. And because of that, Lord, we praise your holy name. Uh, we lay ourselves down before you and we lift your name on high, giving you praise through Jesus Christ. Amen. Be your name, the land that is planted. 
special opportunity this morning to have our message shared by Rick Scruggs. Uh, Rick is currently one of the elders at Northern Hills Church, and he and his wife Debbie have been members of our church now for about four years. Uh, You may not know, though, that previously to being members here, Rick was actually the lead pastor of Bow Valley Christian Church for 40 years. Uh, And so we have been incredibly lucky, grateful to have both Rick and Debbie be part of our community. In fact, over the last four years, they've become integral parts of our community here at Northern Hills. Uh, But we've asked Rick this morning to share some thoughts with us for our encouragement, and he's also going to lead us in communion. And so let's go ahead and let's hear from Rick now. Good morning. I appreciate Peter's invitation to share with you this morning. I must admit that after uh, 20 years of uh, preaching Every Sunday, I do miss the preparation and the uh, opportunity to share with folks on a regular basis. So I'm glad to be here this morning. And uh, thank you for joining us. Like you and uh, like all of the world, I've been thinking a lot about uh, this virus, COVID-19, that has uh, so transformed our experience over the last four or five months. It's curious to me to think about how everyone, no matter where they live in the world, has been affected and have had to adjust their lives in order to accommodate and to try and avoid the virus. And it's not just a minor flu bug that we're talking about. Now, some may suffer only minor difficulties, symptoms. But other people suffer long and debilitating rounds of uh, troubling results from COVID-19. And and of course, most troubling of all is that many people end up dying from the disease. In fact, just this week in the United States alone, 1,000 people died in just one day from coronavirus. That's a pretty sobering number. Most unsettling of all, perhaps, is the fact that there is no vaccine yet available. Even immunity from having suffered through the disease is, uh, is not guaranteed, it seems. And despite all of mankind's best efforts and millions and millions of dollars committed to the task, we still have no proven cure. And all of this kind of got me thinking about how much of a metaphor COVID-19 is for the problem of sin. Just like the coronavirus, sin affects the entire world. The Apostle Paul writing uh, in Romans in the New Testament says, all, everyone has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It doesn't matter where we live. It doesn't matter what our ethnic background is or where we come from. Sin touches every human being on the globe. And much like the coronavirus, it corrupts every aspect of our life, from personal health to economic realities, even social relationships. You know, COVID-19 isn't the first virus to force social distancing. Sin causes the same problem as families and friends break off communication from one another, refuse to speak to each other, all because of various aspects of sin's persistent interference. And economies, economies all over the world are affected by sin, by by exploitation and corruption. 
and tragedy and disease of all kinds indiscriminately ravage health and trigger grief and despair. And just like COVID-19, there is no human solution for sin, despite all kinds of attempts. But the good news, and we all could use some good news, is that while there is no human solution for sin, God, in his infinite wisdom and love, has provided a divine solution. And this is the point of the incarnation. Jesus became flesh and blood. He became human for one express purpose, to solve the problem and eradicate, eradicate the consequences of sin. Now, if you read through the biblical account of Jesus, you might come away initially concluding that uh, Jesus came to, into the world to heal people, to demonstrate God's power, to teach us about his Father's wishes. And while he did all of those things, it's true, his primary purpose was in fact to deal with sin and the separation that it forced between God and his creation. Now, Jesus didn't accomplish this purpose by simply waving a magic wand. It actually took his life, his death, and his resurrection to bring this solution to fruition. First of all, he had to live a life without sin himself in order to qualify as our Redeemer and our Savior. And once again, the Bible tells us that although he was tempted in every way, just as we are, Jesus did not surrender to those temptations. And then, then he allowed himself to be crucified, put to death on a cross, and in doing so, he paid the price for every human being's sin. Again, in the book of Romans, Paul writes, for God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his love, his life, shedding his blood. Uh, sometimes I, I know people can kind of be grossed out by all the references to blood in the Bible and how important Jesus' blood is to our spiritual health. But I think we all understand how important um, blood is when someone survives a disease. The, the antibodies are, are developed in their blood to conquer that disease. And then those very same antibodies can be used to create a vaccine that will cure others. That's the idea behind the power of Jesus' blood. He conquered sin, and now his blood has the power to save all mankind. Now, the final portion of God's solution involved the resurrection of his son. This was Jesus' victory over death. Uh, death came into the world because of sin. It, it was the final separation between ourselves and our creator, God. God the Father raised Jesus from the dead, not just for Jesus' victory, but also so that he could extend that victory to every human being who chooses to put their trust in Jesus. This is how Hebrews chapter 2 describes it. Because God's children are human, human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. So, this is the good news. The pandemic of sin has a cure. Anyone, everyone, can be forgiven and reconciled to their creator and delivered from the eternal separating effects of death if they choose to trust Jesus and his sin-curing work. Uh, this is kind of where things are curious and strange, even depressing, because so few people seem to be willing, interested in taking advantage of God's gracious offer. One day, and all of us hope it's sooner rather than later, a vaccine for COVID-19 is going to be discovered and made available. And won't that be great news? But I'm pretty positive that there will be some people who will refuse to take advantage of that vaccine. I mean, some folks 
are going to be sure that it's all a lie and that the vaccine is going to cause more problems than the pandemic and they are just going to refuse to be vaccinated with the cure. And others are not going to really trust the source of the cure. Uh, they'll be sure that whoever created the cure is really out to control the world and so they'll refuse it. And there will probably be those who think that the whole pandemic thing is just a gigantic hoax to begin with. Uh, that there really is no virus. And so they'll mock the idea of a vaccine for a cure that they don't think even needs to exist. And as I thought about it, I think those are some of the same reasons that people continue to resist the good news of Jesus and his cure for sin. I mean, there are people who are just suspicious of the source. They don't trust the messengers who are sharing the good news for whatever reason. And other folks uh, aren't interested or willing to change their behavior. They think the good news is yeah, too good to believe. And they're not really willing to take a chance on it. And then, then there are always those who refuse to admit that they are even infected with sin. But for those who are willing, for those who will confess to their being infected by sin and accept Jesus as the cure for their infection, to these, God grants forgiveness. He heals our brokenness. He restores our relationships. He extends his victory over death to us. No longer are we required to live in bondage to sin and in fear of death. But just like living in the midst of a pandemic, we can sometimes forget that we've been cured. And, and that's the significance, the importance to those of us who are believers of participating together in communion or the Lord's Supper. We're, we're celebrating our cure from sin. We're remembering or being reminded of how it is that we received a cure. It's not because of anything that we've done but it's because of the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. His body was cruelly broken on a cross. His blood was drained from his body as he died. And this is why he introduced this simple meal and asked us to partake of it. He doesn't want us to forget that we have been cured. So, right now, wherever you are, Take the bread that you've prepared and the wine or grape juice. Let's give thanks together before we partake. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that you've provided a cure for sin. And we understand and realize how easy it is for us to forget that we've been cured or perhaps forget how it was that we were cured, not because we're such good people, but because you, in your love and, mer and mercy, sent your son Jesus, and he willingly died in our place so that we could be forgiven. This morning, we give you thanks. We celebrate our cure. In the name of Jesus, amen. This is my body. Jesus said when he introduced this simple meal, do this to remember me. And now take the cup of grape juice or wine, which represents his blood. Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people. An agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for all of you. Let's drink together.
while there may not be a cure yet for the coronavirus, there is a cure for sin, friends. Praise God for his provision. And have a great week. conclude our service this morning a little bit differently than I have in the past. Uh, I'd like to share a video with you in order to lead us into our time of prayer in our individual homes. Uh, This video is a musical group called Shane and Shane, and they're sharing some thoughts from Psalm 90, and then they're going to share a song that they wrote out of Psalm 90 or based on Psalm 90. But I've recently been really encouraged, uh, especially during this time of COVID and everything happening and all the limitations. I've been really encouraged Uh, by this video. And so I I thought it would be encouraging for some of you as well. But I also think it ties in really well with what Rick has shared with us this morning, reminding us of the great problem of sin in the world and how God has offered us a solution to that problem of sin in Jesus Christ. Let's go ahead and let's spend some time now 
and reflection. You can even begin to pray as they're sharing or as they're singing their song. And as it ends, I encourage all of us to spend some time united in prayer in our individual homes. Thank you for joining us this week, and hopefully we'll see you again next Sunday. I am going to read Psalm 90 and say a couple things, and then we're just going to sing through Psalm 90, which is a very, very, very appropriate psalm to sing in these days. Psalm 90, verse 1 through about 14. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You return man to dust and say, Return, O children of man. For a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past, or as a watch in the night. You sweep them away as with a flood. They are like a dream, like a grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed. In the evening it fades and withers. For we are brought to an end by your anger. By your wrath we are dismayed. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. For all our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. The years of our life are 70, or even by reason of strength, 80. But their span is yet toil and trouble. They are soon gone and we all fly away. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? Have pity on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all of our days. And I don't know if you heard the harshness, but there's some harshness in here. Who considers the power of your anger, O God? Who considers your wrath on sin? And we see trouble and we're promised trouble even by Jesus himself. Oh, you will have trouble, but fear not, for I have overcome the world. You will have trouble. There is trouble because of sin, God's wrath on sin. And I love how this psalm starts. It says, you have been our dwelling place. And now we can sing this song thousands of years later, knowing that our dwelling place, our hiding place is alive. His name is Jesus, and he is our shelter, and he's sheltered us from the wrath of God. And so today, whatever your circumstance is, you can put your faith in Jesus, your your dwelling place, your hiding place, who shelters you, who hems you in, who takes care of you in every circumstance. He doesn't say you're not going to have trouble. I'm just going to take care of you in the trouble. So cast your care upon me. And also this says, I love this prayer. It's like the chorus of this song. Satisfy me, Lord. Satisfy me. Why, who's, who prays that other than the one who's not satisfied? Satisfy me with your love, your steadfast love in the morning. Before I forget, Lord, how good you are. My, my tendency is to, to forget, to wake up and think about all of the things going on out here. Oh, help me remember your goodness. Oh, help me remember that you're my shelter, my hiding place, that I'm safe in you. And so Father, as we sing your word, would you help us to believe your word? Help us to see you as our hiding place, as our shelter, as our dwelling place as the dwelling place for our children and their children. Satisfy us with your love, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me teach you the chorus of the song and then we'll get into it. When the sun comes up, set his fire before the day has passed us by. Before our hearts forget all your goodness, satisfy us with your love. Oh, we 
Thank you. 